weeks we're going to be spending as we read the word, if you're able. <laughs> we're not done with you yet. Hear the word of the Lord of Romans 7, verses 1 to 13. Or do you not know, brothers? For I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she's released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that while we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. Lord Jesus, send your Holy Spirit to us this morning and give us ears to hear your word and hearts eager to change to become more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, Westbrook Church, and uh, I am on this screen because um, I'm not here. Uh, but my heart is here, totally with you. And uh, may the Lord Jesus bless the teaching of the Bible, the reading of his word, and encourage our hearts. In Basingstoke, England, lived Daniel Brandon. Daniel had a pet snake named Tiny. And Daniel, when he got the snake, could literally hold his rock python Tiny in the palm of his hand. There was his pet snake in the palm of his hand, and he would show it off. He was proud of it. He would fondle it. He would feed it. My goodness, it was his pride and joy. You can YouTube him or Google him and find pictures of Daniel. But in January of 2018, 31-year-old Daniel Brandon was found dead in his bedroom. And now eight-foot-long Tiny was coiled by his side, having killed him. His pet python destroyed his life. A snake expert named Garrett Hopkins said these words, there's no such thing as a pet snake. It's a picture of sin to us. Sin which begins small, we can manage this, I can control this, uh, it's not a problem to me. Look, I only bring it out on special occasions, it's very beautiful at times. Look how it shines and look at how it, it does all of its wonderful things and I put it away and I manage this. You cannot manage sin, you don't know where you will end up with it, it is destructive, there's no such thing 
as a pet sin. Romans presents the wonders of justification by grace through faith through the atoning work of Jesus so fully, so remarkably, that we're tempted to think in Romans 6, I think I can sin all I want since Jesus has so much grace. And Romans 6 deals with the issue of being too loose. License. I'll live a wild life and then go to church and pray a prayer and trust Jesus and then go live a wild life again. Romans 7, and that's where we are this morning, goes to the opposite end. And it goes to those who would say, no, my response to sin is going to be that I am going to have a list of rules and I'm going to obey these rules so well that God will be pleased with me. If Romans 6 is too loose, I can sin all I want and forget rules. Romans 7 is too tight. I will keep all the rules, and that will make me right in God's eyes. Romans 6 deals with license. Romans 7 deals with legalism. Now, legalism is a word that we need to define. The children have a sticker for that this morning. Legalism, believing that I can please God by obeying laws and rules. Believing that I can please God by obeying laws and rules. All God wants out of me is obedience and I can do it. Give me the list, I'll do it. My character, my reputation, my upbringing, my grit, my determination will produce a life that pleases God. I will perform my way into God's favor. Legalism always always results in either pride or despair. It is not capable of producing a spirit-filled life of love and joy. Always either pride or despair. So in Romans 6, we are a slave to sin or a slave to Jesus who loves us. And the picture in Romans 7 is changed. In Romans 7, we are either married to the law or married to Jesus. That's the picture in Romans 7. Now, Romans 7, the, the first time you read Romans 7, you're tempted to think, what on earth are these first 13 verses about? You can actually wonder. I wonder if Paul wrote these on Friday afternoon at 4.45. But in fact, the beauty of them comes out with an incredible message of wisdom for believers and for not yet Christians who want to understand what does it mean to follow Jesus. Down at the Nelson Atkins Museum, right here in our own city, is a remarkable painting by Monet. I would encourage you to go and see it. It's a huge painting of a pond scene. And you go in there and you sit. They have you sit and you sit down. And for the, the first time you look at this painting, you think, what is this? I think a, a five-year-old must have painted this. And then as you sit there and as the light changes on that painting, it begins to come to life. And you begin to see the beauty and the wonders, and suddenly you're transfixed and you're saying, I see that, and I see that, and it's all taking shape right before my eyes. That's Romans 7. In a moment you read Romans 7, and you say, this, this just doesn't make much sense to me. But then with the help of the Holy Spirit shining upon, and you must take time with the Bible, with the help of the Holy Spirit shining upon this passage, suddenly you see wonderful truth for Christian living that we must understand. Now, there's every chance that here at Westbrook Church today, our problem is going to be much closer to Romans 7 than Romans 6, much closer to legalism than to license. So let's explore and let's meet husband law. 
And let's ask, what's he like? And what's it like to be married to husband law? Well, we're going to discover at least six things about him here. And each one of these things are things that we are susceptible to want to enamor ourselves to husband law because of. The first thing about husband law is this. He is moral and upright. Look at verse 12. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Husband law is moral and upright. You cannot fault him. Husband law is always good. Husband law never gets anything wrong. And for those of us who believe that through legalism, through believing that through following a list of rules, we can make a life that pleases God, we will discover that husband law is always good. But the problem is legalism is a religion of guilt and fear and intimidation, whereby we become known basically by do's and don'ts, not by our relationship to Jesus Christ. Husband law is moral and good. Secondly, husband law points out all my faults. We have some friends like this, don't we? We have some relatives like this. And husband law is like this. He points out all my faults. Look at verse 7. What shall we say? That the law is sin by no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it was to covet if the law had not said, do not covet. So husband law is always moral, always upright, and he always points out our sins. He's always watching over our shoulder. He's always there to point out all of our faults. Thirdly, husband law promises, but he cannot deliver. Look at verse 10. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. Now, God didn't intend for it to promise life, but we thought it would promise life. We think to ourselves, certainly if I just engage in this religious behavior, I will discover life. Let me tell you a story of a young man. Now, last week we we looked at Augustine, if you remember. Augustine lived in Romans chapter 6. He was as bad as you could be, as wild as he could be. I want to talk to us this morning about a a college student named George. He's 17 years old. And off he's gone to college. And George is the opposite of Augustine. He doesn't want to live a wild life. He wants to live as good a life as he possibly can. And while he's at college, and those of you who have been to college know you might join the running club or the chess club or the debate club, George joins a club, and it's called, get this, The Holy Club. Now, you already know he's into trouble. The Holy Club. And he meets some other friends there, particularly a young man named Charles and his older brother named John. And these three men and and others, too, join the Holy Club. When I was 17 years of age, this is George speaking, I began to fast twice a week for 36 hours altogether. I prayed Many times a day, I received the sacrament every Lord's Day. I fasted myself almost to death during the 40 days of Lent, during which I made it a point of duty never to go less than three times a day to public worship, besides seven times a day to private prayers. And I always chose the worst sort of food. I fasted. My apparel was mean, My woolen gloves had holes in them, my patched gown and my dirty shoes. I walked about on cold mornings till part of one of my hands was black from cold. Whole days and weeks I have spent lying on the ground in silent or vocal prayer and having nobody to show me a better way, I thought I could get peace and purity by my outward 
austerities. Do you see this young college student, George? Some of us have been like him. I'm going to be the, the holiest person. I'm going to fast, and there's a time to fast. And I'm going to pray, and there's a time to pray. And I'm going to take the sacrament, and there's a time to take the sacrament. And I'm going to deny myself, and there's a time to deny yourself. But, oh, George, you're killing yourself. Back to husband law. He's always right. He points out all my faults. He promises, but he can't deliver. He has the power to condemn, but not to change me. Look at verse 9. I once was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. It's as though sin has a life of its own, and it seems like it does, like, like that little snake, Tiny. It comes to life, and it, it takes on its own agenda and has its own pace and its own power. And here's husband law. He comes and he can condemn me, but he can't change me. He can tell me the things I've done wrong. He can make me feel really bad. But like George lying on the ground weeks at a time, he says, I thought I could get peace through these outward things. Fifth. Husband law actually makes me worse. But sin, verse 8, but sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. You know what it's like. There's the sign that says, keep off the grass. What do you want to do? You want to walk on the grass. There's the sign that says speed limit 50. What do you want to do? You want to see if you can break it. I drove faster the whole way. Nobody caught me. Sin is actually enhanced by legalism. Not destroyed by legalism. And then finally, number six, together, legalism and I give birth to death. Look at verse five. In our members, we bear fruit for death. The children that I produce when I'm married to husband law are children of death, not of life. Death, not of life. So here's George. And he says these things after all of, a, of his austerities and all of his difficult treatments of the body, yet I knew no more that I was born a new creature in Christ Jesus than if I'd never been born at all. He says, I could scarcely creep upstairs, and I was obliged to inform my kind teacher who immediately sent for a doctor. Well, what do we need? How do we get out of this marriage to husband law? We see George fasting and freezing and frustrated, but not having life in Christ. How do I get out of this marriage to husband law? I've done everything I can possibly do to try to please God. On good days, I've been full of pride, and on other days, I've been absolutely in the pits of despair. What do we do? Well, Romans 7 tells us, doesn't it? We read it this morning in the first seven verses. There's only one way to get out of a marriage, and somebody has to die. We need a funeral. We need to get out of this relationship, and the only right way out is through a funeral. And here comes Jesus, and Jesus says this. Jesus says, you know, I will marry you. I will marry you. But you're going to have to die first. Because as long as you are married to husband law, I cannot marry you. You're going to have to come to the end of yourself. You're going to have to come to a time where you realize all my strivings, all my efforts, all my boasting, all the things that I'm doing to demonstrate my righteousness are as filthy rags before a holy God. Look at Paul in Philippians. Listen to him. 
Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 to 9. But whatever I had in gain, I've counted loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered a loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Now, it's very hard to hold this funeral for yourself because it absolutely abolishes our pride. We want to be able to say, I am actually better than others. I'm better than others because I vote a certain way, or I drive a certain way, or I live a certain way, or I act a certain way, or I've been raised a certain way. And that's all bondage to the law. And here comes Jesus, and he comes gently, but with a firm word. He says, look, you've got to go to your own funeral. You've got to get to the place where you say, I give up. G.K. Chesterton's famous little essay, What is Wrong with the World? His two-word answer, I am. We all need to get to that place. Otherwise, Jesus can't marry us. Jesus cannot come and rescue me as long as there's any vestige in me which says, I can make this with more determination and effort on my own. I can produce the righteousness God requires. I don't need to humble myself before the gospel. I need to try harder because I know that through my intelligence and my upbringing and my zeal and my determination, I know that I'm better than the warp and woof of humanity. Oh, dear, well, let's have this funeral. Let's have it today. And then let's meet husband Jesus. And I have three things to share about husband Jesus. The first in verses 4 to 6 of our passage is that Jesus empowers us. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may Bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions were aroused by the law. They were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Do you see that? We now belong to another. And this one, by his gracious Holy Spirit, actually indwells us and empowers us to live a new way. Titus chapter 3, verses 4 to 7. But when the goodness and the loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The kindness and goodness, not the hardness of husband law but the kindness and goodness of husband Jesus. And Jesus promises and delivers. Jesus says, I will transform you. Jesus says, I have begun a work in you and I will carry it on to completion until the final day of Christ. That those whom he justified, he's glorified. And it's all done as we surrender, give up, 
and allow him to do his work and to bear his fruit in us. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Abide in me and you will bear much fruit. Thirdly, together we bear fruit for God. Look at verse 4. But now we are released from the law and having died to that which held us captive, so we serve in the new way of the Spirit, not in the old way of the written code. That was verse 6. Sorry, verse 4. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. Suddenly, that which I had been so desiring from husband law is now fulfilled through Jesus in me. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 16, but I say this, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. How do I live the life that God wants me to live? By being united to Jesus by faith. He works it in us, dear friends. So let's go back and visit George. Last time we saw George, he couldn't even walk up the stairs. He'd fasted and worn himself out so terribly. He was frozen and frustrated Near death for seven weeks because of his constant fasting. Near death. He's a teenager. Near death for seven weeks because of his constant fasting. George learned from a book, The Life of God in the Soul of Man. His friend Charles had given him this book. A little book. The Life of God in the Soul of Man. By a young Scotsman who died at the ripe old age of 27. I actually had the privilege of rewriting that book in 2017, and it's a wonderful, wonderful help to Christian living. And here's George, and he begins to read, and he realized that it's by Christ dying and not our doing, Christ dying and not our doing, that gives the sinner acceptance with God. George wrote in his journal, quote, God was pleased to remove the heavy load and to enable me to lay hold of his dear son with a living faith. What joy, joy unspeakable, filled my soul when the weight of sin went off and the abiding sense of the pardoning love of God broke upon my soul. Surely it was the day of my espousal. That means marriage. A day to be had in everlasting remembrance. What joys were like a spring tide and they overflowed my banks and have increased ever since. George, his last name was Whitfield, and this all took place in the year 1735. From that moment, for the next 31 years, George Whitfield preached 40,000 sermons. That's 25 times a week for 30. 31 years. He crossed the Atlantic 13 times. He rode a horse 250,000 miles. And he preached to 80% of colonial America. He was the first American celebrity. But it was the joy overflowing the banks of his life through understanding the righteousness that God gives by faith. Not his efforts that produce this. Do you notice that Augustine's wildness and Whitfield's legalism brought them both to the same place of utter despair? Both to the same place. Near death, totally despairing, total failures, completely ready to give up. They both got to the same place of utter failure and desperation by missing the gospel. Well, it's time for us to draw to a close. Let me give you a little parable as we, as we draw to a close. In the little 
town that my wife and I and our children lived in in South England for 25 years. I would often be found walking through the town on my pastoral calls, this house, this house, up this street, down this alley. And uh, one particular street was very interesting to me, and I noticed it immediately. I've never forgotten it. Here were three gardens on this street. Uh, We call them yards here. They call them gardens there. And here was a garden that was totally overgrown with weeds, completely overgrown with weeds. That's the person in Romans 6. And I I thought to myself, I bet whoever lives in that house, this garden is representative of of their heart. So here's a garden completely overtaken with noxious weeds and no beauty, no life. Then was another garden, and the person who lived in that house had totally solved the weed problem. Because they dug all the weeds up and poured concrete on on their garden. That's Romans 7. Here was a person... They're not a weed to be seen, just a concrete front garden. By the way, the world out there thinks that's what a Christian is. A Christian is fundamentally defined by what we're against. And there are things worth being against, by the way. There's some terrible weeds that shouldn't be growing in our lives. But is the answer concrete? Ah, but here was another garden. There weren't weeds in it, nor was there concrete. It was fragrant and fruitful and beautiful. And there were flowers and colors and life and wonderful things clearly husbanded, clearly cherished, clearly taken care of, and it was bearing fruits of life. That's the Christian response to sin. The Christian response to sin is not just let it go and let the weeds take over. Nor is it let's just pour concrete on everything and just be hard, cold, lifeless. The Christian response is to let Jesus have his way. To let Jesus bear his fruit. Which heart is, how is your heart represented in those gardens today? Oh, Jesus Christ, husband Jesus, wants to bear in you and in me fruit unto God. The answer to sin is not to be wild and loose and then claim grace. The answer to sin is not to be legalistic and hard and say, we're doing this in our own strength. Look at us. The answer is to let Christ come. Christ come. Indwell us by his Holy Spirit. Rule us by his word. And bear his fruit in and through us. Let's take a minute and let's pray together. Let's each one of us bring our hearts before God I know that I'm on a screen today, but the Holy Spirit is with us, and I'd like to ask every person to stand right now, if you would stand, and I'm, I'm trusting that you are on Sunday morning. You're going to stand, and let's bring our hearts before God. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ wants to come, and he wants to, as it were, marry us. He wants us to bear fruit unto God. Lord, we have been, some of us, wed to husband law. He's been good. He's pointed out our faults. He can condemn us, but he doesn't change us. And really all that comes from him is fruit unto death. He's actually made us worse. Lord, I'm ready for this funeral. My funeral to husband law, where I die to the law. I say I'm not going to serve in the old way of the written code anymore. It has not brought life. Lord Jesus, would you please come?
and dwell in me today till joy overflows my banks. And Lord, may my life be like a fragrant garden, not a weed-filled, noxious place, nor a hard concrete slab, but a fragrant garden unto God. Come and empower us. Come and fill us that together in this world we might live lives which reflect the wonders of God and of Jesus Christ, Lord. And we thank you today for this time, and we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.